Hi, I'm Joshua Farnsworth and welcome to my woodworking school. In this video, I'll continue my hand tool guides by talking about these amazing historical hand planes called molding planes. I'll show you what they do and I'll help you understand what molding planes you need for woodworking and which ones you don't. In the last two hand plane videos, I talked all about bench planes and then joinery planes in the second video. And I shared advice on buying various hand planes without breaking your woodworking budget. Now I'll move on to talking about one of my favorite types of hand planes, and that's molding planes. So what are molding planes? As you've probably been able to guess, molding planes are used for making decorative shapes on pieces of furniture or on architectural elements. The light and shadow produced by moldings produces uh, visual interest and dimension to the otherwise plain wood. Unlike the previous hand planes we've mentioned, molding planes only come in wooden bodies, like this. There is one exception. The antique combination planes do offer a couple molding profile cutters, but they aren't very useful in my opinion. Uh, there are a few good modern molding plane makers, but they are all small companies with small production runs, so the prices are extremely high compared with antique molding planes, which if you have uh, a lot of money, it's definitely the way to go. But for the rest of us, I'm going to focus this discussion primarily on antique molding planes. But before I begin, I just want to quickly let you know that this video goes along with my very popular article on choosing hand planes. Uh, below this video, you'll find a link to the article and all my other tool guide articles like saws and chisels and workbenches, things like that. My articles have way more details than I can share in a video, including brand name recommendations. So you're gonna get what I can fit in a video. All right, let's talk about molding planes. There are too many different types and shapes of molding planes and cleanup planes to mention them all in this video. So I'll just focus on a few styles of molding planes that you'll likely want to try out in the near future. Probably the most fun and popular type of molding plane to use is a dedicated molding plane. It's called that because it has a single dedicated profile like the popular Overlow Profile or the OG Profile. And it only cuts that profile in one direction with the board to the right of the plane. You simply line up one of the spring lines to be parallel with your board's face and then slowly take repeated passes further and further back on the board until you're making full length passes. Just make sure to keep the plane in line with the spring line the whole time. You can see it illustrated here with white pencil on it. And when the plane stops cutting, the molding is finished. And just as a cool bonus tip, if you gather all the shavings, you can use them to burnish the profile that you just cut. And when you're finished burnishing, the molding is lovely and smooth, ready for finish. Another tip is to use a shop-made sticking board like this to more easily secure your workpiece while cutting the molding. It's not too difficult to find a dedicated molding plane that's in fairly good shape. Most non-collectible user dedicated molding planes will cost you under $50. I found some nice ones for as low as $15. If possible, try to find one that has a crisp and intact profile that matches the iron and also make sure the wedge isn't missing or that someone put the wrong wedge into the plane. An incorrectly tapered wedge won't hold the iron snugly. That's kind of how you can tell. Some of these planes have boxing inserts which are used to strengthen narrow parts of a profile. So make sure it isn't loose or missing. All of these problems can be repaired, of course, but you might as well start off 
with as easy of a molding plane rehab as possible for your first time. I would caution you to stay away from buying a molding plane that has a major split or a crack in the wood. That's not a rehab project that you want to take on. And to be honest, you'll have a hard time finding a vintage molding plane that doesn't need at least some rehab work. Even the nicest molding planes will require at least uh, sharpening and some other minor tuning. And sharpening a molding plane isn't as straightforward as sharpening a straight edge tool, like a chisel or a hand plane iron. Some people incorrectly suggest that you just flatten the back of a molding plane to get it sharp. Uh, of course, you do need to flatten and lap and polish the back one time, but doing it repeatedly can lead to problems down the road. Uh, your profile will change over time. So you really should learn to sharpen these tools properly. Years ago, I wasn't able to find any really good guides on choosing or refurbishing molding planes. So I joined up with hand plane expert Bill Anderson to make a very detailed well, four and a half hour comprehensive video class on molding planes called Choosing, Refurbishing, and Using Molding Planes with Bill Anderson. Uh, you can find this video class in my store uh, with the link below. So my recommendation would be to either buy a vintage molding plane and learn how to rehab and sharpen it or fork up at least a few hundred dollars to get a sweetly tuned and sharp new molding plane. If you find that you like using dedicated molding planes, then you'll certainly be excited about moving up to the next style of molding planes, hollows and rounds. A hollow plane makes an arch shape in the wood, and a round plane makes a rounded shape, like a valley. By using a variety of sizes of hollows and rounds, you can create nearly any molding profile that you can imagine for your furniture. This is also really useful if you're trying to replicate a historical molding in your house or a piece of antique furniture, which can be really expensive, by the way, if you try to have a, a woodworking shop do that. With the aid of a rabbit plane for removing waste, you essentially just use the hollows and rounds to remove one hill and valley at a time from the wood. Aside from unlimited shapes that can be cut, uh, one huge advantage that hollows and rounds have over dedicated molders is that they can be used in either grain direction. If you find a profile tearing out because of reversing grain, you can just start planing from the different direction to go with the grain, which will give you a cleaner cut. You can't do that with a dedicated molding plane. The hollows and rounds were made in numbered sets, with each number consisting of two hand planes which is called a pair. For example, a number 12 pair would include one number 12 hollow that cuts 60 degree hills and one number 12 round that cuts 60 degree valleys. Uh, every plane cuts 60 degrees of a circle, just a different size section. Think of pizza slices, for example. A large slice and a tiny slice have the same arc at the top. They're just different size slices. A full set of hollows and rounds includes 18 pairs of hand planes. That's a total of 36 planes. That's a lot of planes. I've only ever touched one full set, which belonged to Bill Anderson, as you see in the molding planes video that I mentioned earlier. Many people opt for a half set, either an even sequence or an odd sequence. Odd sets are less common than even sets. My set of hollows and rounds is an even set with pairs numbered from 2 up to 18. This set will cover just about any molding that I'd ever want to make. But most new hand tool woodworkers just buy the most common sizes. A well-known plane maker recommends that woodworkers start with just two pairs or four planes either a number six pair and a number 10 pair, or a number four pair and a number eight pair. Those sizes will work for a large number of moldings. 
In addition to buying fewer sizes, budget-minded woodworkers can also purchase a harlequin set or a mixed set of hollows and rounds. A set that's all harlequin is a set where none of the planes came from the original set. A mixed set contains some planes and pairs that were originally together mixed with some harlequin planes. I personally liked the idea of having matching planes, so my half set is all from the same maker. But of course, it isn't necessary to have a match set like mine. You just have to be careful that a harlequin set of hollows and rounds has an accurate transition because not all plane makers had the exact same size standards. Decent vintage half sets aren't too difficult to find, especially if they're harlequin or mixed sets. They usually cost a few hundred dollars is all. Matched half sets like mine are a bit harder to find, uh, and full sets hardly ever come up for sale. In my article I've shared some sources for those of you who may be interested in finding some new pairs or sets. Brand new half sets and full sets are amazing, but they will set you back nearly $4,000 for a half set, nearly $8,000 for a full set. It's a lot of work to make those. Totally worth every cent, if you've got the money. <laughs> but this option isn't practical for most woodworkers, of course. And if you're really passionate about molding planes, you can take a class to learn how to make your own planes. Now let's talk about another feature to look for in hollows and round planes. The angle at which the iron sits inside the plane in relation to the horizontal workbench is called pitch. There are four different pitches for hollows and rounds planes. Common pitch is at 45 degrees, which is similar to bench planes, and is more suitable for soft woods. York pitch is at 50 degrees. This pitch will work well for woods that are between soft and hard. Middle pitch is at 55 degrees and is ideal for a wider range of hardwoods. And lastly, cabinet or half pitch is set at 60 degrees and is good for very hardwoods and difficult woods. My planes have a pitch of about 55 degrees, which would be considered middle pitch, and they seem to work great with a variety of woods. The last feature to consider when purchasing hollows and rounds is the shape of the mouth and iron. The planes come in either straight or skewed versions, like you can see on mine. Like the rabbit planes, straight planes are better for cutting with the grain, and skewed planes are better at cutting across the grain. But the skewed planes are still good at cutting with the grain. And just like with rabbit planes, the skewed planes usually cost more. But don't worry, either style will work for most applications, and you can always use sandpaper to clean up your moldings in case you have some tear out. But the skewed style will work better if you plan on creating a molding all the way around a tabletop or box lid. The last style of molding plane that I'm going to talk about is called a side bead plane, or also called just a beading plane. It cuts a bead shape on the edge of boards to reduce the chance of damage, and also for decorative purposes. There is a very good chance that you have beads cut into the windows and door moldings around your home. Just go have a look. You can also see here that beads are a great way to decorate uh, an otherwise ugly tongue and groove joint or a shiplap joint. As you can see here, beading planes range from very tiny profiles all the way up to large profiles. The large profiles are usually for architectural moldings, so I don't use these sizes. For furniture making, I've found smaller beading planes to be most useful. A 1 8 inch, 3 16 inch, or quarter inch side bead plane is really great for creating decorative beading along an edge of a board. I like the 3 16 inch size the best, best probably. I use it for creating the bead board look on tongue and groove box bottoms and cabinet backs. Side bead planes don't use a spring line like dedicated molding planes do. 
you just keep the plane vertical and if the iron is sharp, uh, the profile will shape out nicely. Just like other molding planes, side bead planes require a bit more specialized knowledge for rehab work. Bill Anderson, my friend, wrote an article on how to restore antique beading planes that you can find on my website. I'll share a link to his article in the notes below this video in case you want to learn how to rehab side bead planes. You can also cut side beads with a combination plane uh, with a metal hand beater and even with a homemade scratch stock. You can see more details about these other options in my article, but I really like cutting beads with a combination plane. I think it's fun. There are a bunch more specialized molding planes and joinery planes in every conceivable shape and configuration. Uh, but the hand planes that I've mentioned will get you started on the exciting journey of making beautiful furniture. In the next tool guide video, I'll be talking all about what you need to know before buying hand saws, like uh, dovetail saws, tenon saws, uh, bow saws, etc. So if you don't want to miss that video, make sure you click on the subscribe button below along with the notification bell. And if you liked this video, I'd be grateful if you could click the like button and also leave a comment, share some something that you know or ask some questions. Uh, so as always, thank you so much for visiting my shop and I'll see you in the next video. Hi, I'm Joshua Farnsworth. If you liked this video, I've got a whole bunch of other free woodworking videos and articles at my website, which you can visit by clicking right here. You'll go to woodandshop.com. Down here, if you click, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. And over here are some uh, really great other videos that I think you might like to check out.